Right now, we're going to take a look at some of the most damaging hurricane hazards. There's basically two big hazards that do the most damage during hurricanes. The first one of those are the winds. Now, we've already talked about how hurricanes are classified based on the speed of the wind, and those winds can get really, really high. The highest rec recorded sustained wind happened in Hurricane Patricia. So on October 23rd, 2015, they clocked one minute sustained winds of 215 miles per hour in Hurricane Patricia, which is one of the great examples of just how dangerous the wind can be is in this image that was taken after Hurricane Andrew um, in 1992. This made landfall actually twice in Florida. Um, and this was one of the few Category 5 storms that ever actually have made landfall in the United States. and was devastating for the Florida area. Um, and you can see that it, somewhere along the way it picked up a piece of plywood and embedded it through a palm tree vertically, um, not even chopping it in half. Now I'll remind you though that when we're looking at a storm, we have to take into account how fast the storm itself is moving, let alone the winds. So for the Atlantic Ocean, at least in the northern Atlantic, those winds are going to move the fastest on the eastern part of the storm, or at least north or east of where the eye makes landfall, depending on sort of the orientation of the shoreline. I've got a few videos for you that I thought are worth showing. I'm going to cut out the, the sound. It's actually pretty, pretty impressive what the sound's on. Um, <laughs> but these are some amazing winds. Um, this is from Hurricane Michael which hit the coast of Florida, or at least the panhandle of Florida. And this um, had sustained winds of like 155 miles an hour. It made landfall right at the edge of a Category 5 storm. And you can see it's not the wind itself that's really dangerous, although it can knock you over. Um, but it's the debris that gets picked up and blown around. And that debris is able to hit people and knocks over trees or those trees are debris and they fall on houses. And so that's how a lot of people end up being severely injured or killed during hurricanes because of winds is because of this debris. So Hurricane Michael was pretty impressive, but here is Hurricane Charlie. And this is right at the eye wall of the storm. This video is pretty long, but this is right in the eye wall. And this one is where um, there's wind gusts of over 155 miles an hour um, that this person is sitting through. And we're going to hit it here in one second. And there it is. Of course, these videos are created by storm chasers. I in no way encourage or condone being out in these hurricane winds like this. Um, but I will admit he did get some pretty amazing footage, especially if he's right at a um, at a gas station. And if you were to compare this to the footage before of what the gas station used to look like, um, it's pretty impressive. And he ends up kind of panning around and you can see cars overturned further away. This is another one from Hurricane Michael. And you can see those high waves and that high water from the storm surge here. Um, but other things you can see if we go a little bit further, you can see the shingles flying off the roof. Now shingles end up being a major hazard in terms of um, hurricane debris because they get picked up so easily. 
Here's a case where the entire darn roof gets picked up and blown away. And this is another one. You can see the wind actually gets under the eaves of the house. They create pockets that overhang you see on the, the blue house on the right. And even where we're losing it now, those overhangs create a place for the wind to grab and to get under. And once it hits the side of the building, it pushes up from underneath. And so for a home that is built right on the coast, look at that sand blowing. Oh, we're going to talk about sand in a minute, y'all. Look at that sand and all the dust and stuff blowing. Uh, and so, like I said, that's, that's why these are particularly dangerous is because of how much debris gets blown around. Now, these are really famous images from the Labor Day hurricane of 1935. If you'll remember, that's one of only four Category 5 hurricanes um, to make landfall in the United States. This one actually made landfall going across the Florida Keys. And in 1935, the Florida Keys were nowhere near as busy as they are today. There were very few people living down there. It was a bit of a playground for the rich one of the folks that are best known for living here and, and actually was in this area in during this hurricane um, was Ernest Hemingway and so the uh, the rich and famous would travel down to the Keys and the only way down there at the time was a railroad track and 1935 was sort of the uh, middle of the Great Depression there were a lot of people pretty pretty devastated and and in dire straits during this time. One group of people who fell into this was World War I veterans. So this is a very long after World War I, but you had a lot of army veterans who needed a job and needed to work. Unfortunately, these men were too old to join the Civilian Conservation Corps or the CCC that provided jobs to unemployed men during the Great Depression. But because of some arm wringing and political pressure, um, World War I vets were hired as part of what was called a bonus army. And so one of the things that a gr this group was doing is they were working in the Florida Keys to try to um, rebuild this bridge that actually connected the keys and, and make it more sustainable. Um, unfortunately, what happened is they were all camping along the Florida Keys at the time. So they were all basically living in tents as this Hurricane 5 storm barreled down. Now, a train was sent to go get them, but as you can see from these pictures, it didn't go so well. The, the, uh, the train actually derailed on the way down. And so all of these vets had to endure this hurricane five storm in the tents on the beach with literally nowhere to escape. Now, what's interesting, and I've looked over, I promise looked over the internet. Um, there were quite a few deaths during this particular hurricane. And of those, over 400 of them were the World War I vets that were exposed during the storm. And there are reports from the people who went into their camp afterwards that some of the people, most of the people had died because of drowning, because that's a common way to die in a hurricane. But a significant number of the victims um, had actually bled out, not from acute injuries necessarily, but they were on the beach and the wind blows. And I don't know if you've ever been on a beach in just normal winds. The sand kind of stings, right? Um, the story goes that the ridiculously high category five winds was able to whip that sand hard enough that it was actually able to sand blast off skin. Um, and so some of the victims are said to have been sand blasted to death. Now that I got that out of my system, 
Um, let's look at what to do to help protect yourself and to help protect your home. So one of the most important things that can happen is that an area can enact building codes. And these are rules you have to follow when you build buildings. And a lot of times these are different um, between things like school businesses and um, school buildings and buildings for businesses and buildings for homes. So we saw the roof fly off of a bunch of houses in one of those videos. Um, as odd as it sounds, a lot of time your roof is only held on to your house thanks to weight. <laughs> Literally, it's just sitting up there um, or it's not affixed very well. So one of the most important building codes is requiring these tie down straps um, that actually affix the roof of your house to those um, ceiling cross beams that are there. What this can do is it can keep the whole darn thing from ripping right off. Because shingles are such a big, scary thing during hurricanes, um, those shingles need to be set correctly. And so one of the most important things is to be able to determine where your prevailing wind direction is and what direction those hurricane force winds should be coming from and you line them up the other way. Um, and that goes for designing your roofs in general, um, avoiding those big wide overhangs that we saw in the building and putting them shingles on right. Now here in Arizona, I think it's a lot of clay tile roofs, um, which thankfully don't get flung around so much during hurricanes, especially um, if you're looking at that kind of Mediterranean style of houses that happen in Florida, um, but shingles, are pretty common elsewhere in the US. One of the easiest things is because you can replace them fairly easily um, and they're cheap. So they're like big pieces of paper with tar and rocks stuck in it, oddly enough, and they are heavy. So when they get to flying, they're pretty dangerous. So there are specific kind of ways to design and how you put the shingles on. It includes sealing the gaps in the plywood sheets that make up the most of your roof. It includes double nailing um, <laughs> the shingles down and actually, and actually overlapping them correctly because if you have less exposure, they don't pull off quite as easily. Now, windows are tricky. Windows are one of the big things that are lost during a storm. Um, this is a test of hurricane glass. So hurricane glass is designed to take objects hitting it at hurricane forces. Um, I don't remember what the speed of this particular two by four was. A lot of times they'll hit it at 150 to 200 miles an hour. That's kind of what they aim for with their cannon. They shoot a two by four out of a cannon. Um, but the goal of your hurricane resistant glass is number one, it can break, but it can't let objects come through. So the whole window cannot fail because you can imagine if that glass were just to shatter and fall that you would end up with all sorts of rain and water and debris getting flung in much less um, broken glass being flung into the home itself, which none of those are nice. The other thing it has to do is withstand the wind once it's broken. And so they do test, and you can't see it in this particular video, but they do test those broken windows and they blow winds at speeds of 150 to 200 miles an hour at the windows to make sure that they don't fail steel. Um, they are not super cheap. Um, and you got to replace them all in the event of a hurricane. There are some other choices. Um, one of the really nice, fairly cost effective ways of protecting your windows is with hurricane shutters. Um, and they're made out of lots of different things. These are um, probably aluminum or steel. Um, obviously the uh, heavier the shutter, the better it does protecting it. But what's nice is that these shutters actually just fold up and you can't see them. Um, so when a hurricane's coming and it's time to batten down the hatchets, you just cover all your windows. The shutters take the brunt of the damage. And then when it's over, hopefully you should just open them back up and go back to uh, go back to your life or probably cleaning up quite a bit around your home. Um, 
but not everybody has those. And so you can see the plywood that gets put up over windows as well. This one cracks me up because you can tell that they've, they've been through a few storms. So um, looks like Isabel <laughs> in 2003. And then Irene in 2011. So apparently they just stored this plywood for those eight years, or at least only named the really big ones there. Now, in some cases, a house can actually be blown completely off its foundation. Um, I know this isn't the case everywhere, but lots of homes are built on cement slabs. And those cement slabs, the house is literally just sitting on it. And the only thing kind of holding the house to the ground is your plumbing. And so even heavy winds during a thunderstorm is able to move an entire house. This is a picture of a case where this happened um, earlier in 2020. So this is obviously not a, well, this wasn't a hurricane storm, but it did have thunderstorms with some pretty heavy winds. And apparently uh, state troopers were driving down State Route 74 between Yatesville and Thomaston um, in Georgia and called in. And they're like, hey, dispatch, there's a house in the road. Um, so I would, I would suspect that Dorothy's house getting picked up and carried off in a tornado is really not that far-fetched, actually. And so building codes can require that the walls actually be affixed down to the slab of the home um, to protect against this. All right, so winds, hazard number one, mainly because of the debris that it's able to carry and do a lot of damage. Hazard number two is the storm surge. Most people who die during a hurricane actually die from the storm surge itself. Um, so a storm surge is a rising of sea level under that hurricane. And this is a combination of high winds that actually push the height of the water up um, as well as low pressure. Because if you remember those hurricanes are a low pressure center. And so if it's not pushing down on the sea surface as much, the sea surface is actually able to rise up a little bit, which is actually kind of awesome. That only makes up about 5% of the storm surge, but it is there and it is pretty important. Other things that can affect the storm surge too is the um, phase of the moon um, and so and the tide. Because if you think of normal kind of high tide, low tide, as it's making landfall, if your storm surge as on top of your normal high tide, it makes it quite a bit higher. Um, so yeah, so to give you an idea of what this looks like, um, one of the sort of highest ever recorded was in past Christian, Mississippi. This is just post Hurricane Katrina. Um, and this is somebody out trying to measure just how high the storm surge actually was. And if you see on that tree, the bottom part of the tree is kind of pale. But if you look at the very top there, it's a lot darker because the bark is still there. What that means is the waves and the storm surge itself actually stripped off all of that bark up to a given height. That means if that man had been standing there when Hurricane Katrina passed, he would be that deep underwater, which is honestly pretty horrifying to be, um, to be honest. Um, now here's you another kind of picture to show what this looks like. So you can see the storm, the hurricane itself is moving to the right of the image, the image and those winds, especially on that, eastern side or the right side here in the northern atlantic those winds are pushing the surface of the water and it's able to push up that storm surge and you can see that swell and so as the hurricane gets closer and closer to shore the water gets deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper to give you an idea this is a really cool video from the weather channel um, talking about 
a previous continues hurricane. to close in along the northern Gulf Coast. This is Michael. We do expect life threatening and catastrophic storm surge flooding along with it. Now let's use these maps to show you how much water rise above normally dry ground you should prepare for. These maps made by the National Hurricane Center give us almost a block by block assessment of how much flooding to expect. For example, let's zoom in on Panama City, Panama City Beach, a very popular area of the Florida coast. These areas in yellow up to six feet of flooding above normally dry ground. This is going to flood businesses and homes, and it's not just going to be at the beaches. It's going to be inland as well. Now let's go down the beach farther to areas near, for example, Port St. Joe. This is a very vulnerable area of the Florida coastline to storm surge flooding. We do expect significant flooding there downtown as well in areas in yellow and orange up to six and even nine feet of flooding above normally dry ground. So what does that look like? Well, let's show you. Imagine this. Imagine three feet of storm surge right here. Now, if this amount of water catches you by surprise, it's too late to evacuate. Cars are floating around and floating away. There's large objects in here that could knock things down with a battering ram-like force. Now, there's no way, again, to evacuate with this kind of storm surge. But we know there's going to be places with more than three feet. Imagine six feet of storm surge. Now, this completely floods out the first floors of homes and businesses. And the only way to escape that is to move to the higher floor of a building. Now, unfortunately, there are going to be places that get more than six feet of storm surge flooding. Imagine this, nine feet and even beyond of flooding, of inundation. This is practically not survivable. So please follow the advice of your local officials when they ask you to evacuate. And if you have any questions about what evacuation zone you're in, if you need to go and or where you need to go, go to floridadisaster.org. And by all means, everybody, Please stay safe. So when we think of flooding because of hurricanes, it's not usually the rainfall, although there is some pretty serious rainfall. The flooding is because of the storm surge. Um, Hurricane Katrina is a little bit special kind of, of example because most of the flooding actually happened after the hurricane due to levees starting to fail. But after Hurricane Katrina, um, one of the things that you hear a lot in the media when these big storms are coming, like Hurricane Harvey that hit Houston just a couple of years ago, if you live in these coastal areas, they tell you to put an axe in your attic because as this water rises and rises and rises, maybe you, you know, go up to the second floor. And then the water keeps rising and is coming up your second floor of your home. And so a lot of people end up, the, you can't go outside at this point. So a lot of people end up taking refuge in the attic of the house because that's the highest point. But if that water keeps rising, there were cases where storm surge has been as high as 20 feet or higher. When it gets that deep, you're going to drown in your attic. And so you keep an ax there to be able to actually hack a hole in your attic to climb onto your roof so somebody can see you and maybe come save you. Um, hopefully. Um, and it's, it's sort of horrific to think about, right? So the deadliest storm surge that's actually been recorded happened in 1970 during the Bola cyclone. And this affected Bangladesh and West Bengal. Um, on the on the Sea of Bengal, on the northern side of the Indian Ocean, and this particular storm surge left five hundred thousand people dead. That's one of the deadliest hazards. Period that we're going to talk about. The highest recorded storm surge is from an eighteen ninety nine cyclone Mahina which affected Australia. And the record for that was actually 44 feet. That's flooding out like a four-story building. Now, there are some concerns about the validity, validity of this number and that it might be kind of the winds pushing the water further up, up hills because of the fairly steep topography there. But even if that wind is further pushing it up the hill, um, that is still some deep, deep water. Here's another example of some storm surge. 
This is Hurricane Ike, which affected the Texas coast, in particular Galveston Island in 2008. We're going to talk more about the Galveston hurricanes to give you a better idea of this. But one of the things the city of Galveston did was actually create a seawall on the edge of town to try to protect the city from a storm surge, actually. Um, up until this, it had done, done a fairly good job. But what you can see is in some of these, that storm surge is actually coming up to the seawall. The seawall is anywhere between 9 and 15 feet high. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you should have like at least a 10 foot drop from this road, which is called Seawall Boulevard, down to the beach. And this is where I used to go to the ocean when I was little. This was our beach that we went to in Galveston. Um, so I'm more than familiar with what that seawall actually looks like and just how far down it is. And to see particularly kind of these shots at the end where they, they pan out and you can see the ocean surface, the surface of the ocean is level <laughs> with the top of the seawall. Um, and so it's that's pretty impressive. And one of the reasons why Hurricane Ike was particularly devastating for Galveston, the storm wasn't that big, um, or at least the category wasn't that big, but the storm surge was enormous. Here's some more examples of flooding thanks to that storm surge. Um, Hurricane Floyd in 1999 brought pretty severe flooding. Um, you can see here in North Carolina, there were entire towns standing underwater. And if you look in this picture on the right, you can see this helicopter. There was no rain falling down. The sun is shining bright and all that water is still there. It takes a long time sometimes for this water to go away. So it's not like it's waves coming in and out. Um, it's not like a tsunami, which we'll talk about where the water comes in and, you know, devastates everything, but then goes away. Um, this water from storm surges, particularly if you have low lying areas, can come and fill in and just leave the water standing there. Now, if we go back to these building codes to prevent the flooding, one of the most important things you can do is actually build on stilts. That's, that's about as good as it gets. Um, if you're going to be in those low lying areas, obviously your best bet is to not be right at sea level. But if you're at sea level, to build higher um, so that at least the bottom parts of your home are all that's affected. And this is a picture I found, which I thought was pretty interesting to sort of show what a home that's built for extreme weather and in particular hurricanes for us. But you can see this home includes a lot of the things we've been talking about, like... 30 degree slopes on the house that eliminate wind or at least lessen wind resistance, short overhangs so the wind doesn't get under there and peel it off, steel shutters and safety glasses, uh, safety glass in the windows. Um, some of these are sort of not necessarily hurricane stuff, but a battery system is actually pretty important because um, Hurricanes are notorious for blowing out electricity. And unfortunately, these happen on like, you know, the Gulf Coast and the Florida Coast, or at least, a, you know, eastern seaboard of the U.S. And if that hits in uh, September, which is when hurricane season generally peaks, it's hot. You know, in that, that August and September months, if it's, you know, it can be 100 degrees outside, with like a million percent humidity and without any sort of battery system, things get pretty gross pretty fast. Um, you can see it's raised above the base to help with flooding, although in a hurricane area, you're going to want to get higher than that. Um, but yeah, and the roof tied down and screwed in shingles rather than just nails. So this really covers a lot of those things that a house needs. Okay, there's a couple other little kind of hazards that come along with hurricanes, especially tornadoes. So tornadoes are a violent rotating column of air, which is in contact with both the surface of the earth and the clouds above it in the storm. These generally fall close to the eye wall of a hurricane. And you can have 
lots of hurricanes or lots of tornadoes throughout a hurricane. The record is held by Hurricane Ivan, which hit Florida in 2004. Um, and there are there were 120 confirmed tornadoes during that. Now, from somebody who grew up in Tornado Alley, that very bottom part of it that's in uh, northern Texas, one tornado is really scary. 120 of them, even spread out over a large area, is horrific. Um, Hurricane Katrina had 57 confirmed tornadoes. Um, some of them as far away as Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania had five tornadoes because of that storm system, although it wasn't a hurricane by the time it got there. Um, the example I've got here for you is Hurricane Claudette. It made landfall right around Brownsville, Texas in 2003. The reason why I show you this is I actually rode part of that out in Houston. We got really lucky because it was pretty far south of us, but I was interning at NASA Johnson Space Center, which was so cool. And if you don't know much about Johnson, um, that's where they keep the moon rocks. You know, the, the rocks that they went to the moon <laughs> during the Apollo program to get and bring back. All of those are housed at Johnson Space Center. So I actually got to sit through meetings with uh, NASA executives on the or at least the people in charge of those moon rocks as to what they were going to do if a hurricane was coming right for us. It was pretty fascinating. Good news. We got some rain um, and wind but a, and a whole lot of flooding, but but not much else. So we, we rode through it pretty well. Um, but this actually spawned a couple of tornadoes, and this is the damage from one of those tornadoes in Palacio. Even if you're not in the bands of the um, the rain bands of a hurricane anywhere along the coast of the United of like the East Coast of the U.S. when there's a hurricane approaching um, can have really dangerous rip currents. Now, if you've ever seen these, they're they're pretty hard to spot. There's a couple of really nice pictures. So rip currents are places where the water goes a lot of times over a sandbank as it's washing in to shore. Um, but when you get that backwash, it's called the swash and backwash. Gross, right? But when you get the backwash of the wave going back out, um, it's not as strong. And so it can't necessarily, the water can't get over those sandbars very well. And so when there's a little inlet in it, a lot of that water goes to those little um, cutouts. But it's a narrow area, which means the water moves really fast. And so you hear of people dying in rip currents um, or a rip tide if you will, um, because they're swimming. And when you hit one of these, it starts pushing you out to sea. Um, and for most people, your first thought is to, holy crap, I got to swim back to shore. And you end up fighting the rip current until you are exhausted. So um, if you ever find yourself in one of these, don't swim back to shore, actually swim sideways because these are generally not very wide currents, so you can escape them pretty quickly. Now you can see how those uh, high waves and currents along the coast can do a lot of work, um, especially on places like North Carolina, um, the coast of North Carolina where you have um, all the islands there, and the Gulf Coast of Texas, which is kind of bordered by barrier islands, too, you have these kind of wide sandbars. And so those currents can actually erode away the sand of those sandbars um, and do something called inlet opening. Of course, there's also beach erosion. If you look here, this is a house in Vero Beach, Florida. And this is an image taken August 12th, 1997. And I've never actually visited, but I've been told by students who are from Florida that this is a pretty swanky place to live. So these homes are not cheap. Um, but you can see it's, it, it makes sense, right? Because they're back ports. You basically walk out your back porch and across your backyard and go stick your toes in the sand. Um, so like I said, this was August 12th, 1997. This is September 8th, 2004, right after Hurricane Francis. You'll notice that now when you walk out your front, out your back door, you don't even have to walk across your yard. <laughs> you just literally step down on the beach. So you can see how much of that yard has actually been eroded away. Oh, but wait, there's more. 
This is the same home in 2004 after Hurricane Jean. And now, well, your bedroom is on the beach, but it wasn't planned that way. So at this point, um, that, that house is uh, probably not livable anymore, unfortunately. So when we look at total hurricane damage, like I said, mostly from flooding because of storm surge and, and damage from debris being flung around by the wind, the most expensive hurricane in the United States is tied Hurricane Katrina in 2005. And a lot of that I mentioned earlier was actually after the hurricane because of the loss of the levee. So we'll talk a little bit about that later and hurricane harvey which hit houston in 2017 and both of those caused 125 billion dollars worth of damage now harvey was particularly um sort of expensive because it hit houston it's a major major urban area um and lots of fairly wealthy parts too um lots of business buildings and all of that kind of adds up very very quickly but if you'll notice Harvey in 2017, Maria in 2017, Irma in 2017. We jumped down to Michael and Florence, both in 2018. So we have had a bunch of really costly, really damaging hurricanes just recently. And even Hurricane Sandy up there in 2012, um, that is the one that hit New York and greatly affected um, Manhattan and New Jersey. 